Good morning and welcome to the Gospel Loft. We do the last part of Elijah the Prophet, part 7 today. And in the introduction I've written that the last time we brought a new face, Elisha, into the picture. He will take over from Elijah one day and become the head of the school of the prophets. In this part we say farewell to Elijah with a grand finale when the man of God is taken up into heaven on a chariot of fire. But before this great event can happen, there are two more stories to tell from the Book of Kings. It is the story of Naboth, uh, Naboth's vineyard, where the names of Elijah, Ahab and Jezebel converge once more on the stage of a biblical narrative. It is written down in 1 Kings, chapter 21, verses 1 to 16. And we want to read some of it as a kickoff to our sermon today. But the second story of today is when fire comes down once more. And here, 1 Kings 21, verses 1 to 5. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab spoke unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it as a garden of herbs, a vegetable garden, because it is near to my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than this. Or, if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said unto Ahab, The Lord forbid me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto you. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word of Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down onto his bed and he turned away his face and would eat no bread. But Jezebel his wife came to him and said unto him, why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? Yeah, Ahab told Jezebel the story of Naboth, and the devilish woman promised him to take matters into her own hands. I will get you this vineyard, my king, she said. If Jezebel has set her mind to something, she will go to any lengths to achieve her goal. She smears Naboth's name black among the important people and finds some who will testify against him falsely, saying that he has blasphemed God and King. The false witness against Naboth brings a verdict of death to the man. They take him out of the city and stone him to death. Let's read it. Verse 10. And say two men, son of Belial, before him to bear witness against him, saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king, and then carry him out and stoned him, that he may die. And so it happened to Naboth. Jezebel informed Ahab and told him to go and take possession of the vineyard. And verse 16 we read, and it came to pass when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab rose to go down to the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, to take possession of it. Ahab and Jezebel signed their own death warrant as Elijah appears once more before the king. To take away another man's birthright was a capital crime in Israel in those days. In our own situation, it is the devil who wants to rob us of our birthright and our inheritance. But as long as he can keep us away from Jesus, we cannot stop or step into our promised inheritance, which is the inheritance of salvation. God became man in Jesus Christ to die for our sins that we can become the children of God and his legitimate heirs. Oh, what a story that is. But now, now let us get back to Elijah. Now, first subtitle is, The Word of the Lord Came to Elijah. 
And here we read it in 1 Kings 21 verses 17 to 19. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he is gone down to possess it. And thou shalt speak to him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, hast thou killed and also taken possession. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where the dogs licked the blood of Naboth, Shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine? Now God sees what the kings and rulers of this world are up to and often sends a heaven-inspired ambassador to them, to warn them. In our time it is the believing church who keeps the prophetic word alive and is a witness against the kings of the world. Again and again it is the spirit of Elijah that accuses the rulers of the world of their abominations which they commit before the Lord. But first it must be that judgment begins at the house of God. We cannot be a witness if we have not cleaned up our own house. And we read it in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17, for the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? God will have to tighten our belts quite considerably before we will take any notice, even as a church. God means business and will not let up. We cannot have one foot in this world and hope that God will judge us differently. The floods and the fires and the earthquakes will continue also for us, until we take refuge in him alone. Thou hast killed and also taken possession, it says. You've taken possession of another man's inheritance. The fear of Ahab and Jezebel is no more. Elijah has realized that his future is not in the hands of an earthly king. Where the word of God is spoken, the demons tremble. Nobody can withstand the word of the Lord, for it will surely come to pass. Elijah accuses Ahab of murder and robbery. It is today still one of the highest crimes a man can do. He was the cause of Naboth's death and robbed him of his inheritance. He's just a crook of the worst kind. With the accusation also comes the judgment and a pronounced punishment. The dogs will lick your blood where the dogs licked Naboth's blood. It is a death sentence for sure. In the spiritual sense, it is a ticket to hell. He earned a second death for himself and for his wife, Jezebel. The next title shows that nothing has changed in the relationship between Ahab and the prophet. Elijah, the enemy of Ahab. And we want to read it, 1 Kings 21, verses 20 and 21. And Ahab said unto Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found you, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon you, and will take away thy posterity, and will cut off from Ahab him that pisses against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel. Hast thou, hast thou found me? <laughs> Ahab says, when the prophet of the Lord pays you a visit, it is most of the time not a good sign. It feels almost as if the police was knocking at your door. It looks as if Elijah is a permanent thorn in Ahab's life. He pronounces a final judgment upon the king. God will remove everything that will remind the people of Ahab from the face of the earth. All his seed will be destroyed together with his wife. And the Lord is doing the same thing today. One by one of the evildoers will be removed. Beginning at the house of God. Where is the voice of the Lord? Where are the signs and the wonders that follow the preaching of the word of God? The church has amended the gospel, invented new gods for themselves and running a world all of its own. 
It is a religious monster that fits in well with the rest. The prophetic voice of the church has almost been silenced. The promise of the Lord is nevertheless that he has given unto the church some prophets. Ephesians 4.11, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. These are gifts of men given to the church for the ministry. We cannot purchase an office from the Lord, nor can we take it up in our own strength. The true office will always make room for itself. In Acts chapter 8, we have Simon the sorcerer who wanted to buy the gift of the laying on of hands from the apostle be able to demonstrate the power of the Holy Spirit. God is not for sale. During the Middle Ages, the office of a bishop could be purchased from the Pope with large sums of money. It was an ungodly business. Here is Elijah, one of the chiefest prophets of God, who speaks to the king. Yes, I have found you, he says, and come to curse you and your wife, because you have defiled my nation. The judgment is terrible against the king. I will make an end of your name among the living. All your sons shall be killed. None shall survive. Just think about such words. If they should come to you, all your children are going to die because you have rejected God. And in a wider sense, it is exactly that which will happen to all humanity if we do not turn to God through Jesus Christ. Look at your unsaved family. Look at your neighbors, your friends, your colleagues at work. Do we want such an office to prophesy unto them? No, thank you, Lord. Don't you have some other job for me, please? And we want to read verse 23. And of Jezebel also spoke the Lord, saying that dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. And in verses 24 to 25, Him that dies of Ahab in the city, the dogs shall eat. And him that dies in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, who Jezebel his wife stirred up. And soon Ahab, the enemy of God, will die, and his son Ahaziah rules for a very short while. He did just like his father, and Elijah did one more sign before the new king. Ahaziah fell through the lattice of his upper chamber and broke probably some bones, but then he got sick. He then sent a messenger to inquire of Balzabab, the god of Ekron, if he would live or die. And then we read in 2 Kings chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, it is not because there is no God in Israel that you go to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord, thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And Elijah departed, and when the messengers turned back unto him, he said unto them, Why are you now turned back? The angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, After the death of Ahab, Nothing changed in Samaria. His son took over for a short while, and Ahab's habits continued with his son. How fast had they forgotten Carmel, and the people together with their evil king ran after Baal again. It seems that God only is looked to when things are really bad, but here the final mark had already been passed, and God had made up his mind to forsake Israel. In the north, the present king needed some extra fire from heaven as a prelude to his death. The king is dead sick and sends his messengers to the priest of Baal or the priests of Baal to inquire if he should live. God has another plan and he calls on Elijah. Go meet the messengers and tell them that their king will surely die because they have once again ignored the ways of the Lord. Is there no God in Israel whom you can ask? Elijah's message is just confirming the previous verdict on Ahab that 
says that his sons shall all die. But then Elijah meets the king's messengers on their way on the road and he delivers the final word to Ahaziah. The messengers turn around 180 degrees and go back to the king with a word from Elijah. I would like to add something right here that will concern us in the future. How far do we have to obey a secular government and their laws? As long as it relates to secular issues, we obey. We obey the laws of the country and we pay our dues because the Bible teaches us that they have been set over us for good or for our punishment. When the state asks us to inquire of the gods of Ekron, we refuse to do it. We hand in our notice if we work for that government and we look for another job. At present it is this level that the church is divided on. How far do we go? On both ends we have those that preach extreme measures, but in fact they do nothing else but to kill the little unity we have left and force some weird prophetic, prophetic interpretations. That, that's the situation today, yes. We don't want to go and inquire of the God of Ekron. No, that far we don't go. But then 2 Kings verses 1 and verse 7, uh, 2 Kings chapter 1 verse 7, and he said unto them, What manner of man was he which came to meet you and told you these words? And they answered him, He was a hairy man with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, It's Elijah the Tishbite. <laughs> what manner of man was he? By their garments you shall know them. Your clothing makes people, goes the saying, but they can also deceive us. The prophets of the Lord look a little different. We saw in John the Baptist, probably the last dressed in the traditional prophet gear, eating uh, a prophet, prophet's diet. Long beard, long hair, goat hair, mantle, leather belt, locusts and wild honey, food brought by ravens or angel food. Well, we recognize them immediately. The prophets of Baal today are dressed in cartucci, finest linen, shiny shoes, gold chains, Rolex watches, Rolls Royce cars and helicopters. Their words are full of lies and full of false promises. Don't listen to them. The king in his purple and royal blue apparel recognizes Elijah immediately. It is Elijah the family foe. Then we read verses 9 to 10. Then the king sent unto him a captain of 50, with his 50. And he went up to him, and behold, he sat on the top of a hill. And he spoke unto him, Thou man of God, the king has said, Come down. And Elijah answered, and he said to the captain of 50, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty. And there came fire down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Now the king sent the captain of fifty. The question always remains when God is in the game, who orders who around? Ahaziah thought that fifty men would be ample to bring in Elijah and make him come down from the mountain. A thousand men would not have been enough to get Elijah down except God order it. The king says, Thou shalt come down, you man of God. One thing was clear, he was the man of God. Yet their tone of voice was a slight measure of mockery and quite some self-assurance which often accompanies an official order. Give a man a little job in the government and he will shortly begin to rule. They received the proper answer to their behavior. Fire came down, consumed them all. And then verses 11 to 12. 
Again also he sent unto him another captain of fifty with, fifth, with his fifty. And he answered and he said unto him, O man of God, thus hath the king said, Come down quickly. And Elijah answered and said unto them, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and thy fifty. And the fire of God came down from heaven, consumed him and his fifty. Yes, again the king sent the captain of fifty. Man seldom learns the first time, isn't it? This Elijah can surely not do it twice, but he could, and he did. The second captain had not learned yet. With a similar arrogance, he addressed the prophet, come down quickly. It still sounds like an order. And fire came down again to consume the second captain and his 50 men. You know, the same wages is always received when there is no repentance. And then we read verses 13 and 14, and he sent again a captain of the third 50 with his 50. And the third captain of 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah. Now it's becoming better. And besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these 50, thy servants, be precious in thy sight. Behold, there came fire down from heaven and burnt up the two captains of the former 50s with their 50s. Therefore, let my life now be precious in your sight. The third captain. The king still hadn't learned. And it was none of his concerns how many of his soldiers had to die. He couldn't give two hoots. He knew that he would most probably die himself, and why should he not take a few dozen with him? The godless will always receive the appropriate wages. The third captain got wise, and he bent his knees before Elijah, as he understood that this was indeed the man of God. The man of God for the moment at least. And there was no mockery nor any arrogance in his voice. Just fear. Let our lives mean something to you. And let us live, was his plea. Without a plea for grace, there is no hope for any man. The rulers of this world are sending their servants to die for them. And fire will consume them together with their lords. Fire is one of God's final tool of revenge on the ungodly masses. Fire will eventually consume the universe. Even now we have more and more fires that burn all over the world to show that it is time to repent. Second Peter cap, uh, chapter 3 and verse 12 Looking for and hasting on to the coming of the day of God wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The things that we see today are not just the result of fossil fumes and plastic waste. They are the finger of God pointing to the sin of men everywhere. We are looking for a new heaven and a new earth coming down from heaven. We read in uh, Revelation chapter 21. Therefore, invest the time in preaching the gospel instead of saving an earth that is doomed already. Here we have a good example. God sees the heart of the captain and stops the fire from falling onto him. Then he speaks to Elijah and, and verse 15, And the angel of the Lord speaks unto Elijah, Go down with him, be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down with him unto the king. Fear not, Elijah. Elijah waited until the Lord gave him the go-ahead and a word to pronounce it without fear to the king. God always goes before and prepares the way for his servants. He clears the way of all the resistance, removes the opposition and puts the fear of God into his enemies. The king of Israel is condemned to death and will see no grace. There comes a moment in every person's life where God says, enough is enough. I had enough of you. And we want to read a couple of verses from Romans chapter 1. The first one, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. 
righteousness. And then verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. God had enough. Do whatever you like. I will draw myself from you. Here comes an end to the prophet's working. And the Lord directs him to a place where Elijah would be taken up into heaven. Like it happened to Enoch. Or to Moses who could not be found on Mount Nebo. Let us have a short look at that final event. 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 1. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elijah from Gilgal. Yeah, when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven. The Lord wanted to do a last and lasting miracle for and with Elijah. The whole of the prophetic world knew that something would happen to Elijah on that day. Something was in the air. Everybody spoke about Elijah's going away. But nobody knew how it would happen. They just knew Elijah's going home. And we read 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. And Elijah said unto him, that Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee. For the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho, and the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know. Hold your peace. The young prophet stood afar off and looked over to the banks of the Jordan River. Elijah took his mantle, rolled it together, hid the water, with it. The water was divided to both sides and the two went over on the dry riverbed. Elijah asked the younger Elisha if there would be something that he could do for him before he goes. A double portion of your spirit, Master Elijah. That is my request. And then we read verse 11, 2 Kings chapter 2. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. <laughs> a story cannot have a better end. Until next time when we pick up the story of Elisha and continue. Until then, God bless you. Amen.